Hello, everybody, and welcome to one more of our webinar in the series of Autometrics webinar. Today, the topic is how to build today's vestibular cleaning equipment, reimbursement, and referrals. The presenters today are Jeanette Fitz and, and Don Kim, uh, Kim Don. Uh, and uh, both uh, are co colleagues of mine working in Autometric as well as few audiologists in the US. Uh, you know me by now, uh, as I'm always the moderators for these uh, webinars. So if you've been here before, I'm also working in Autometrics and uh, uh, as education and training manager in the headquarters where Don and Janeta are in the US. Just a little tips and tricks, uh, housekeeping. All participants are muse, muted to reduce background noise. It's possible to ask questions. If you see on your right side of your screen, you will have a question box. You can write down there your question. I will collect the questions and in the end of the webinar, I will ask uh, the presenters. Uh, if your question has not been answered during the webinar, we will send an answer for you. Now I will change the presenter for for Don Kim. Welcome, Don. Thank you. Our agenda will generally start with uh, how to establish goals on the vestibular clinic. I think this is becoming more and more relevant these days, as as I think more audiologists um, and other providers, um, ENTs and PTs, are getting into uh, the falls assessments and the balance clinic assessments, um, balance assessments. Uh, arenas because of the changing in industries, especially in the U.S. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, establishing the goal, but also um, developing a protocol that's, uh, that works efficiently and also that is streamlined uh, based on uh, the type of patient that you potentially see in your clinic. And we'll also go, to, go through some uh, epidemiology of uh, business as well. Um, and then Jeanette will close with uh, some reimbursement considerations and then um, how to drive patients into your door. This is a, the big topic for 30 minutes, but uh, uh, we'll try to squeeze it as much as possible, okay? So next slide, please. Jeanette, there you go. So we define the goal of uh, today's vestibular clinic as providing an efficient, accurate, cost-effective avenue for the triage, testing, and diagnosis of physical patients through innovative yet evidence-based means while maintaining profitability. And then we've really focused on the efficient and cost-effective and profitability component because we realized in today's climate, you know, regardless of whether or not you're a hospital system or a private practice, um, to uh, our, our goals are to make sure that we don't lose money on vestibular. Um, vestibular has been one of those one of those uh, uh, services that has um, generally been subsidized by other parts of the clinic. Um, so we want to make sure you're running efficiently, not just for the business operation, but also for patient care. Uh, we want the patient to actually get to the diagnosis as quick as possible, but also to an accurate diagnosis using some of the new technologies we have today. Next slide, please. So it's, it's uh, this research by Epley and Weinberg shows, you know, how shows the path of patients through our um, healthcare system in the United States, um, and this, you know, this might change based on the country that you're in, but an average of four and a half different physician visits or different physicians before actually receiving a diagnosis. Um, that's that's kind of scary to me, in my opinion. And when you're when you're dizzy, I mean, this patient's definitely not acute by the time they uh, visit their uh, last doctor and they get a diagnosis. So a lot of uh, a lot of what we as diagnosticians um, can use to actually uh, effectively diagnose um, the vestibular or dizzy issue, um, you know, might be uh, might be some of it might be complicated, which is uh, which is you know which is bad to think. And, and the actual cost of somebody with chronic balance disorders exceeds about a billion dollars per year um, in the U.S. for medical patients. Next, please. So we talked about an annual spending amount in the ED emergency departments. It's about $4 billion with another $5 billion spent on those admitted. Um, you know, the reason we mention uh, emergency departments is 
you know, a lot of times when patients come into the emergency room, they present with symptoms that are very similar with uh, stroke. Um, so a lot of testing is done for these individuals um, that's uh, where they assume that they potentially have a stroke, not just vestibular disorder. So if there were a way to actually effectively diagnose uh, an acute vestibular disorder um, uh, from a, a, a stroke patient, you know, this could actually help the, the healthcare system, uh, not just the emergency department, but, you know, the patients that are then actually sent to, um, uh, to the referring source, you know, that might be, uh, might be a more effective referral. And in terms of these patients, uh, when they have vestibular issues, social life was disrupted 57% of patients in the study. And 27% reported changing their jobs over having a vestibular issue, and 21% uh, ended up giving up uh, working and going on disability, some kind of disability as a result of dizziness. And over half of the patients felt that their efficiency at work had dropped considerably. And all of these numbers, they make sense to us that we've seen these patients, they're debilitated. And uh, you know what we don't oftentimes realize is that it has such a drastic effect on their life. So the number of physicians they see, um, the slide before, that really has a big, uh, big effect, not just on you know, the overall economy of vestibular, but also the patient and their patient's life and the quality of living. So next slide, please. And in terms of who has these vestibular dysfunctions, um, this uh, Vita um, article says that over 35% of US adults aged 40 years and older have a vestibular dysfunction at some point in their lives. Now that's, that's a pretty big number. Um, this is just in America. Um, and so, so this this number you know kind of spells uh, tells us a pretty you know pretty uh, pretty grim picture here that there there are a lot of individuals above forty years of uh, of age that have vestibular issues and obviously the most common ones include BPPV, Meniere's uh, labyrinthitis, neuritis, um, and uh, vestibular migraine according to uh, Dr. Agrawal at Johns Hopkins um, and BPPV uh, accounts for about fifty percent of cases in older adults according to Bob Bevern as well. Next slide, please. And the reason we go over um, the epidemi epidemiology of these studies is it's good to have an idea of what type of patients you see in your clinic. Um, what I encourage all of my, uh, all of my um, uh, fellow colleagues to do is to actually create their own clinic norms. So you don't have to have 2,000 patients to create clinic norms. You can have 10, you can have, two, uh, you can have 100. Um, but you can retroactively go back and look at the diagnoses and uh, do this. But it's important to understand what type of patient um, population you're looking at just to make sure you're, um, you're, you're, you're uh, I guess, you're the, the, the types of patients that you're seeing in the future match up to the retroactively analyzed data that you have for, um, for normative data for your clinic. So if something's out of um, out of sync with a new provider that you have, uh, you can maybe retrain and, and actually focus on um, their training a little bit more. Um, but anyways, so let's look at this, uh, these numbers here. 60% of all patients are considered within normal limits, um, are, according to Stockwell in 2000. Now, every clinic's gonna be a little bit different. Uh, if you're, let's say, a Mayo Clinic, you're gonna have uh, probably a, a, a smaller number of normals because you're referred more difficult patients potentially, um, and, and this distribution of abnormality, of the 40% down here, um, that might change as well. So uh, Stockwell says 25% of all patients have a peripheral abnormality, 5% have CNS, and 10% have non-localizing abnormality. This was in 2000, mind you. Um, so let's go over some different types of tests that could potentially uh, change this that have come out since then. So next slide, please. So before we get to the actual equipment, we have, you know, let's go over, um, let's go over the vestibular system just a little bit. Uh, I'm sure most of you are very well versed in vestibular, uh, seeing as a, how you are spending uh, 30 minutes with us here uh, on the vestibular presentation. But generally we have three sensory inputs. We have the vestibular uh, input, the visual, the proprioceptive, uh, proprioceptive. And then all this data goes into our cerebellum and its brainstem and processes this information and pushes out three uh, compensatory motor outputs. 
um, a vestibular ocular reflex or a VOR, uh, a motor impulse to control eye movements, or to motor, uh, a motor impulse to control postural adjustments. Um, so, you know, we use all of these inputs to actually generate these three outputs uh, to make sure we maintain balance and gait. Okay, next please. All right, so the different uh, vestibular tests. So if reviewing the anatomy a little bit, um, and this is very general, uh, we understand, but uh, we, we want to understand how we assess and diagnose for site of lesion. Um, let's, let's go over the peripheral vestibular system uh, because ultimately when we diagnose um, peripheral vestibular system in previous tests, we're talking about calorics, uh, which assess the lateral horizontal semicircular canal. And there aren't very many tests that we have um, uh, that quantify data uh, um, that actually uh, assesses the static functionality of uh, these peripheral sites. So the superior branch of the vestibular nerve innervates the lateral canal, the anterior canal, and the utricle, whereas the inferior branch of the vestibular nerve innervates the posterior canal and the saccule. And when we look at, I, I tell everybody we have, you know, generally seven different sites in the peripheral vestibular system in each ear. Um, that that uh, we need to be assessing and we need to be testing for. Um, currently, we only test one of those seven. And, and, so, and so this is, you know, for me, this is kind of uh, a big picture that we're missing in our general uh, vestibular diagnostic layout. Next slide, please. So what all tests do we ha have and what all tests are common in, um, in, in vestibular clinics? Well, we have, uh, we actually did a really large survey for, um, right before AAA uh, this past year, or the American Academy of Audiology Convention. And uh, we, we got responses from uh, hundreds of people um, in vestibular testing and diagnostics. And uh, what we, you know, what we found was that um, the majority uh, were, you know, were doing, they had really long appointments for these vestibular, uh, vestibular clinics and oftentimes went into the three hour mark. Um, now, it's, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily if that's what you want out of your clinic, but I, I understand that most people don't have the time for a three hour time slot. Um, so looking at all these tests, let's see what tests you know, actually actually work efficiently. You know, you have your audio, audio uh, diagnostic tests, of course, um, and then calorics uh, for your lateral semicircular canal for a slow, slow um, frequency simulation of uh, the vestibular system. And then you have your VEMP testing for your otolithic organs, um, your saccule and your utricular testing. Um, and then you have your v uh, which assesses, um, which is a vestibular head impulse test, which assesses uh, all the semicircular canals by doing a head impulse and reporting the eye movement. Um, you have electrocochleography, rotary chair, which is really expensive, um, but provides um, some really good information on bilateral vestibular function. And then posturography, which is oftentimes used by the PT market right now, um, which uh, we understand is, is not a very good diagnostic tool uh, when it comes to uh, diagnosing site lesion um, and changing your protocol based on it. So next slide, please. So when we look at these sites, over on the left, we, we just you know, rewrote those sites of lesion. And then over on the right, we wrote some of these tests uh, uh, that fit into which site of lesion uh, they, they aim to diagnose um, or to help, uh, to help you know, assess the functionality of. And the, com the two common test types are the, uh, the, are the vestibular head impulse test and the OVAMP and the CVAMP. With those two tests, it seems as if you can assess the entire peripheral vestibular function. Um, now, you know, we understand that VHID does not necessarily replace caloric testing uh, because there are different frequencies of stimulation. Uh, VHID is more high frequency active head rotation frequencies, and then, um, and, then, uh, and then the calorics is very low, I think it's 0.025 hertz um, stimulation. So they assess different parts of the vestibular system, uh, dif different functions of the vestibular system, but they assess the same side of lesion. And um, next slide, please. And then what I'll do is I'll have Jeanette pick up from here. Um, and she's gonna talk a little bit about titrates and, uh, and, and some of the other aspects of uh, building a vestibular clinic. All right, thank you, Don. 
So basically, as Don was talking about, we've got all these tests and how to make sense of all of them, we really want to focus on what's the symptoms of the patient. So the most important part of your vestibular exam really starts with the case history. Because if from your case history, you can figure out kind of what direction to go with your testing, then you might eliminate doing parts of the battery that um, would take up a lot of extra time. So this is a uh, kind of focused approach on how to look at the case history. So Dr. Newman Toker out of John Hopkins University um, put this article out. And really the two main focuses are looking at the timing of the symptoms and what are the triggers. So the timing would be, is it episodic or is it acute? Um, and then the triggers would be, is it certain movements or is it kind of just always there? So based on that, you're going to see that there's kind of some common categories that you might put the patient diagnoses into. So if you look at some examples there, if it's episodic and it's positionally provoked, those can be things like benign positional paroxysmal vertigo, whereas if it's more episodic and spontaneous, then it's going to be more Meniere's or more migraine uh, type of provoked symptoms, or if it's more acute, and post-exposure, it could be from trauma, such as drug exposure or head uh, injury. Or if it's more acute and spontaneous, that could be something more associated with vestibular neuritis or stroke. So it's really kind of looking at what does the patient report, and that can actually help drive what tests and batteries you may um, choose. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Don referred to a survey that we did before for AAA back in April, and we had 108 people reply out of 1,000 requested, and they had 50 questions, and out of those 50 questions, we asked things like the type of testing you're doing, the amount of time, are you, um, well, how, how is your reimbursement, and then marketing. So this slide here shows you a breakdown of the types of facilities that the patients were, or sorry, the clinics were at. So you could see about 37% of them we're in an ear, nose, and throat type of setting. And then another big chunk of them were from a hospital. So very clinically minded types of facilities. And then a smaller chunk were from universities and then private practice. So the big question here was what types of tests do you have and how are you utilizing them? So if you look on the far left there, the first four test types have to do with the VNG battery. So from the ocular motor, positional testing, and then calorics. So the blue is the yes and green is no. So you could see almost 100% of the um, replies were doing VNG as a part of their battery. However, all the other vestibular tests that we refer to, such as VHIT and VEMP, are being used in a much lower capacity. So you can see only about 40% of clinics were using VHIT and about 60% were using VEMP. So when Don showed you earlier how VHID and VEMP can actually be used to assess a majority of the system, you can see here that it's still actually being very underutilized. We'll talk maybe more about why not. So why not? Why isn't VHID being used? Why isn't VEMP being used? Well, in the US, um, we don't have a CPT code that's designated to VHID or VEMP, so it's an unlisted code that's being used. So with that, um, it's hard to sometimes get justification on purchase of the equipment from certain uh, facilities. So when you're trying to make a capital request, there can be a resistance from administration because they don't see the clear-cut reimbursement on that. And then the money for the equipment um, can definitely be a, a hindrance as well. And then also the perception that it takes a lot of time I already have a long appointment time for the VNG. How do I add this into my um, battery? So um, we were trying to help clinicians possibly rethink the workflow. And rethinking that workflow really is going to be driven by the kind of clinic that you may be trying to um, establish. So are you just trying to screen the patient for vestibular disorders, or do you actually want to do a more comprehensive type of approach? So if you're doing more of a screening type of approach, obviously you're gonna start with case history, your audiometry and emittance,
but then maybe we'll start with just doing some positional testing for uh, benign pos uh, positional vertigo. So maybe not the full static positional battery, but just screen for BPPV and then use the VHIT testing to look for our semicircular canal function. Whereas if we're gonna do a more comprehensive clinic, we may add more of the battery into it. So you can see here, looking at the peripheral category of vestibular pathology, um, using the VHIT and using static positional testing and caloric testing, doing our two VEMP options. Some patients we may need to do electrocochleography on or rotary chair. Um, as well as imaging to look at like MRIs or things like that to see what's going on with the actual anatomy of the ear. Whereas if we're uh, suspecting more central pathologies, we're gonna focus more on some of our ocular motor studies, so our gaze, pursuits, saccades, um, as well as all the peripheral vestibular um, tests in combination with that. Whereas if you look, if we're just uh, really suspecting BPPV, um, we're going to assess for that through standard um, positional testing and then possibly move to treatment with canalith repositioning maneuvers. So it's just really thinking about the workflow based on the case history and working efficiently. So working smarter, not harder. So then the question is, what's reimbursement and marketing considerations um, for all of these tests? So when we're thinking about that, what's the why? we got to look at what are the aspects of the department or the practice operations? You know, are we trying to have increased profitability, more referrals? Or, um, do we have uh, want to have less staffing turnovers? Um, how are we going to acquire the equipment? So we got to look at all of these factors when we're developing this clinic, so that we can really make sure that we're maximizing our practice. So what are some of the considerations? Are we gonna have insurance reimbursement? And I know some of this will vary depending on the countries that you're in. Um, or is the patient going to privately pay for some of these procedures? Um, we gotta consider things like the economics of the business unit in this. What's our profitability? Um, are we gonna expand or grow our practice in the future? Um, what's the expense of the employees, the payroll, the healthcare costs? Um, are there costs that are fixed, like you know the building versus variable costs, uh, such as you know we may have to have uh, consultants in at times if somebody's going to be on vacation, things like that, and then just other miscellaneous costs like what you know the heating and all of that in the building. So if we focus on what it costs to run this business and how to effectively do this, we can lead to better patient care because we're going to be able to provide services in our clinic by evaluating these other needs in the clinic. So some of these CPT codes here, you can see these are some average US reimbursements for some of these codes. So knowing what we can uh, receive reimbursement for will really help us know what we can get back from our business. So just some examples here. Um, if you look here, the basic vestibular examination, which is most of the VNG battery, which is going to be your ocular motor and your positional testing, is about $103. So most clinicians will say it takes them about an hour to do that part of the test. So about $100 um, is what you're going to be reimbursed. And then if you look at uh, caloric testing down there, if you're doing all four um, conditions with cool and warm, for right and left ear, it's about a $40 reimbursement. So about again, about a half hour is that part of the battery. Um, you're only gonna get about $40 for that time. So it's really, you know, stopping to think, you know, what am I getting for the time that I'm doing things? Now you'll notice on there, VEMP and VHIT were not on there. And the reason for that is, um, they are not currently listed codes with uh, VHIT and VEMP. So they use an unlisted code. And so with that, there's not a direct reimbursement. So you can see the amount's gonna be variable. So with that, um, you gotta consider what am I gonna possibly have the patient pay privately for that? Or what can I possibly try to get back from insurances? So this is just a little bit more information. If you are using an unspecified code, um, if they are a Medicare patient, they are going to have to sign what's called an advanced beneficiary notice, and you're going to require a lot of documentation if you are going to submit to insurance 
Um, Medicare will not pay for this, but if they do have other third party insurances, you may be able to get them to pay for this. But it will require this extra documentation. So I'm just going to show you a quick, few quick examples. I know we're running low on time here. Um, so looking here, this is just kind of looking at more of a screening approach. So if you're going to do head impulse testing and you're going to do maybe some spontaneous nystagmus and some quick positional testing, your average reimbursement would be about $118. So it's about a half hour of your time. Whereas if you're going to do a more comprehensive exam, where you're going to do more of the full VNG battery, you're going to do V-HIT, you're going to, going to do VEMP. Um, it's going to take a lot more of your time. It's going to take about two hours. But you can see here, the reimbursement's going to be a little bit higher. Um, you're going to be at about $430. But 72% um, of that time was spent doing VEMP and V-HIT as far as the reimbursement there. So um, who do we target with this? Um, we target the patients, obviously. Um, providers and possibly nursing homes. These are just some of the different um, facilities you might market towards if you're going to establish your vestibular uh, clinic. And I'm going to go ahead and jump to the end here because I know I want to give a few minutes here for questions. So um, just kind of putting it together here, who is it that we're um, really focusing on here? Um, we're focusing on really using all the different providers such as the audiologist ourselves, but also working with physical therapy, neurology, ear, nose, and throat physicians, optometry, ophthalmology, on looking at full, bringing this patient, patient full focus back and bringing their balance back together. So it really does provide, it really does require the multidisciplinary approach to collaborate on patient care. So this is just kind of um, a recap of using these protocols we talked about earlier, reviewing the patient possibly in certain facilities if we have multi-specialties together, talking about these patients on a weekly basis. And if we are able to do that, we might be able to share some of these vestibular costs with some of these other specialties that are also working to keep the patient in balance. So some of the different equipment we refer to as VNG, video head impulse testing, VEMP testing, um, which is through an evoked potential system, and then posturography, uh, which is done through a balance system you see there at the bottom. So this is just a quick screenshot of all the different equipment that can be used to do this testing. And then as far as obtaining the equipment, um, this will again vary on the clinics that you're at, but sometimes you can use co-ops, you can use buying groups, leasing options, um, take advantage of discounts, and then also um, some IRS reimbursement here. I'm going to just go ahead and go past here just because I want to go ahead and get to the end so we can have questions. Um, these are a few resources. You can always gain more up-to-date information on what's being done with the research, but I do want to give you time to open up for questions, so we do thank you for your time today. Can you hear me now? Uh... Yes, yes, I can yes, hear you. Good, good. Perfect. Thank you, Jeanette and Don. Thank you for our presentation. It was very good and quick. I know it was a, a longer presentation that you had to shorten up, but it was really good uh, idea of... Uh, is there any question? I can see in my question box there is uh, no questions. Uh, type it in. And, and one, of the, one of the things I wanted to clarify um, from Jeanette's presentation, uh, and the, about the $400, uh, $400 plus reimbursement for the entire VNG battery and the VEMP and VHIT, um, the 72% uh, actually referred to um, the amount of reimbursement that we get from a VEMP and VHIT protocol uh, from, from those two tests. Um, and then the fact that it only takes, you know, 15 minutes to do VHIT and then maybe 15 to 30 minutes to do VEMP, uh, it's, I think it's the more efficient route for a peripheral, um, for, to start a peripheral battery than uh, going through the whole VNG. Yeah, and one of the discussions that we had, I think, uh, in AAA uh, last year, or this year, was it, uh, was um, how do you think people can manage to book the patients? If they go for, uh, do 
a VHE test in the beginning and, and they don't know what, what they are going to encounter later on. How do they plan their day? Yeah, how do they plan the schedule? Yes. And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's where your clinic really has to kind of sit down and, and figure out how you want to do this. I know some clinics that have multiple vestibular providers and they just open up the schedule because they are that busy um, and, and kind of free, uh, free form it in the sense that as the patients come in, uh, they just see them and they triage them and they treat, uh, they diagnose them and then uh, they set them up for a treatment. Now, I know not every, every clinic can do that, and most clinics, in fact, can't do that because they don't have multiple vestibular providers doing vestibular services at any given time. But, um, you know, I've seen the open schedule platform work pretty well. Um, I've also seen, um, you know, the triage happen prior to the vestibular appointments where they fill out the questionnaire and they triage it and then there's a decision maker that says, okay, this sounds peripheral, send them peripheral. This sounds central, send them central. Now, it doesn't mean that if you're sent for a peripheral battery, that you have to do the peripheral battery. You can always re reassure that, uh, or you can always look, um, look at the case history and uh, confirm that that's the route you want to go and then change it up if you need. And then, then uh, the only thing that they have to think about that they will have to plan ahead and see some of the patients ahead if it's a new patient. You will have to have an interview or sending a case story before, right? Sure. Yes. Right. That's exactly. Yeah. yeah. The, you know, once once you schedule it, well, I mean, getting in the habit of um, the individual on the phone, maybe going through some of these questionnaires, um, or uh, you know, actually actively sending the uh, the questionnaire, uh, the case history to them, and having them fill out prior. Um, so all of these things, you know, they they really do make a difference. I have a question here. Uh, we are uh, an ENT clinic with neurologists on board and are still not getting reimbursement for VIMP and VHIT unless we use electrophysiology code for VIMPs, even with the cover reporting include all, including all information. Your company recommended we submit in, conjun in conjunction with the test results. How can how can you build a clinic if you are doing these testings for free? You can't. Wow. <laughs> so so you have to get reimbursed. Um, and 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 in my opinion, that's uh, that's a crucial point. Um, as Jeanette said, um, and Jeanette, if you have any other in, yeah. uh, any other input, you know, please add. But um, as she mentioned, that Medicare doesn't pay for it, but for those individuals that do have privatized insurance. Um, the successful clinics that have uh, been getting 92.7 reimbursed have really uh, worked with their billing uh, company or their billing individual and pursued these insurance companies. Now it takes a lot of legwork at the front end, but working with the insurance companies, um, all the private insurance companies and assuring them that this is medically necessary, that it offers something that no other test does um, and going through that you know, process in the beginning, and as painful as, as it might be in the beginning, um, they will start approving, uh, they will most likely start approving that 92700 code uh, for those tests. Uh, the more you, you know, the more you um, hit them up. And, and, and the problem with a lot of, um, a lot of you know, clinics is that the billing department and the provider don't always work close together. Um, but to set this up, you really do have to, and you really can't give up on it. Um, and as hard as it is, it's definitely worth it. And that's that's the way you get reimbursed. Yeah, and well, I should that... also add. I'm sorry. I was going to add to that as well. That also, um, if they are Medicare patients, and you know you're not going to get reimbursed, if you do have them sign that ABN, you can also have the consideration of private pay, um, where they, it's a fee for service type of procedure. Yeah, there's, a, yeah, there's and, also a comment the, the, here uh, that uh, it, could we approach Medicare and how can we how can we do that uh, to 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 start having this discussion and and perhaps uh, finding out how can we get reimbursement for this within Medicare as well is a is a a comment for a person here. It's advocating sure. with the um, like your American Academy of Audiology, American Speech Hearing Association where they're going to have to be the advocates for getting Medicare to recognize this and having a code established. 
Now, a lot of individuals, um, they, they say, you know, be careful what you ask for. So yeah. once, once, they, once Medicare puts a stamp on it, um, they, they set a price for your service. Uh, <laughs> if you get reimbursed $15 for V hits, you know, would you still do it? Probably not. So I think, you know, I think it's a, it's a fine balance of whether or not you want Medicare to actually put a, v, uh, put a code to these tests. Um, but uh, but also what Jeanette had mentioned, you know, the AVN is um, is is very um, it's not it's not common that it's used in audiology because audiologists don't feel comfortable charging uh, for your services. But in other medical practices, the AVN is quite often readily used, and um, what it does is it just pays for the services that you provide that Medicare doesn't pay for. Um, so it's an advanced beneficiary notice that you you have the patient sign uh, before you see them uh, before their appointment and they agree to pay for whatever Medicare doesn't pay. Um, and so you, you, this can't be an exorbitant cost, obviously, um, but it, it's something that's something that, you know, the patient is willing to pay. Um, and what I've seen for VHIT is anywhere between about sixty five dollars to about one hundred fifty dollars for the VHITs um, total package, the lateral and verticals. Um, and so in, in terms of your bang for the buck um, in a profitable center, that is probably uh, the more the most uh, cost effective peripheral test that you have. Um, so, you know, it's it's it takes legwork to get there. But you could um, if you want to go the insurance route, but you could also um, do the ABN and um, and get reimbursed in the private and uh, private market as well. Okay, uh, then I think I will say thank you for both of you to come here and present. It was a very interesting morning presentation from for us, perhaps afternoon for some 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 other people. Uh, and uh, stay in touch with us. We will have a, a new webinar again in a month. Uh, yeah, thank you, Don. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good day, everybody.